I grew up here in Nigeria as the son of missionaries, and I've had some really good opportunities to see prayer at work in their work and in their lives as a kid. But now that I'm out here as a missionary myself, I am excited to be involved and to see the direct results of prayer. You know, without prayer, I don't know how I could cope with all these patients. The whole ministry here at DLWA is operated by prayer. It was begun in a prayer meeting in Wheaton, Illinois, in a college dormitory. It's been continued by prayer. And if it ever, if it does continue, it's going to be by prayer. God's plans are so much bigger than our short-sighted ideas. He's building our lives. And so even though prayer isn't a magical tool for getting the quick, easy answers that we think are best, it's important to talk to God about everything. Our prayer is being answered because of people at home. You ask me why I pray, it's rather like asking a child why he talks to his father. Uh, I pray because it's the most natural thing for a believer to do. Uh, I pray because I have a loving father. I pray because I want to know what my father's will is. I pray because I want to tell my father what I think of him. I pray because I know my father has all the power to answer prayers. I'll never forget the first time that I visited these falls, Niagara. I was just a child at the time, but I can still remember standing here overwhelmed at the tremendous power, the raw force and energy these waters contain. And yet, for centuries, all this power went untapped, just poured over the edge here unused. It was only when we learned that we could harness this power through hydroelectric plants that it became useful to us. The same is true of God's power. It's always there, unlimited, pulsing, just waiting for us to avail ourselves of it. And how do we do that? By prayer. Without prayer, no power. With prayer, the power of God himself at work in our own lives and through intercession in the lives of others. Right from the start, by prayer has been the motto of the Sudan Interior Mission. We believe in prayer with all of our hearts. In everything the scripture says, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Not that we fully understand prayer, but because prayer is the power source for God's work. That's why the scriptures command us to pray. That's why Jesus taught his disciples that they must either pray or faint. And that's not even an option. Let me read just one of the many scriptures that stress prayer. This one's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Give yourselves wholly to prayer and entreaty, Pray on every occasion in the Spirit. To this end, keep watch and persevere, always interceding for all God's people. Think about that for a moment. Pray on every occasion, always interceding for all God's people. Why? Because prayer moves the hand of God. For reasons that I suppose will always be a mystery to us, God has promised to work in response to people's prayer. We avail ourselves of his power through prayer, and only through prayer. I received this letter yesterday from uh, a good friend in Australia. He concluded the letter by saying, let us covenant to never cease praying for one another. After all, prayer is our greatest weapon. 
I was very sick two years ago and felt that our work here in Nigeria had finished. But the church at home were very faithful in praying for us and the Lord heard their prayers on our behalf and restored us so that we were able to come back again here to Nigeria. I can remember some very uh, vivid in the, the history of this place once when we were pouring concrete and we prayed th that it would not rain for the day because it was a large job and uh, one of our staff members was flying in that day and as they circled the place it was raining everywhere else but it did not rain here at Elwa until the concrete got hard and we've prayed for uh, fruit we prayed that uh, the Lord would show us uh, some results of our ministry and in just a little while we heard of of a dying Bassa woman who gave her heart to Christ, the first fruit that we knew of. And so over and over again, we've depended on the Lord, and we've seen him come through. Now each of us has seen God's power at work through answered prayer. We've prayed, he's answered, maybe in a miraculous way, or maybe through the ordinary events, but he has answered. But what about those so-called unanswered prayers? What about the times when we pray for something and nothing happens. Or maybe even the situation gets worse. What then? Well, first of all, we know better than to doubt God's ability to answer. He's God. There's nothing that we can ask that's too difficult for him. And we know that he hears us when we truly pray. God does work in response to prayer. But he works to achieve his purposes not ours. And we don't always understand what his purposes are. We're finite, limited. We're unable to see the whole picture the way he does. But God's made provision for that. Let me share just one other verse of scripture with you. This one's found in Romans 8, verse 26. And in the same way, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now isn't that great? God takes our prayers and makes them conform to the will of God. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And what's the result? Well, it says that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. So prayer is always effective, whether the answer comes in the way we want it to or not. With that in mind, let me share with you a couple of things that we in SIM have learned about prayer. The first is in the matter of timing. We go by clocks and calendars. But God goes by eternity. So the answers to our prayers may not come just when we want them to. We may be called upon to wait and wait and wait. Like the people in Hebrews 11:13, We may even have to die in faith not having received the promise. And that's exactly what happened to the young men who founded the SIM back in 1893. This is where they landed. Lagos, Nigeria. Of course, when they came, it wasn't the bustling city that it is today. But they came here with the burning desire to carry the gospel deep into the interior. There were some missions here along the coast, but the six million people of the far interior were virtually unreached. Here, let me show you on the map. They started here at Lagos. Their goal was up here 900 miles away in the Lake Chad area and they would have to travel every mile by foot. These are the men. Walter Gowans, Thomas Kent, and Roland Bingham. Their venture was backed by little experience and even less money, but a great deal of prayer. Walter Gowans wrote to his mother, we are confident of success. We believe God is going to do impossible things. And how did God answer their prayers? Well, 
walter gowans died within a few months without ever reaching his goal and as far as we know without leading even one african christ shortly after that tom kent died and roland bingham he had to return home stricken with malaria it seemed as though god didn't answer their prayers but it was only a matter of timing he did answer and in a way far beyond their wildest dreams This church is only a very small part of the answer. It's just one of the four and a half thousand congregations that have come into being as a result of SIM ministry. Over a million believers worshiping in a score of languages on any given Sunday. Gowans and Kent died without seeing any results. But that didn't mean that their prayers had been in vain. God was at work. And in his good time, the answer did come. There's another particular answer to prayer that you must see. It's here in the city of Daura. Daura is in Nigeria's north, right in the very heart of Islam. In fact, tradition tells us that Daura is the place where the great Hausa nation was born. 30 million people, almost all of them Muslims. For years, it was a closed area, no missionaries allowed. Still, many people prayed for the establishment of the church in that area. One such man was SIM pioneer, Andrew P. Sturrett. His lifelong passion was to see the gospel take hold among the house of people. He prayed for them relentlessly. As far back as 1908, there's an entry in his personal diary about his burden for Daura. September 7, 1908. My heart asks God this day for a line of missions east towards Egypt, a line west towards Timbuktu, and a steady progress north towards Daura. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Our dependence is in God. He will not disappoint us. And the Lord didn't disappoint him. Mind you, he prayed for over 40 years and died without seeing a thing happen. In fact, he was in heaven for over 25 years before he could look down and see the answer. No, we don't always understand God's timing. But then, we don't need to. If God tells us to pray, we know he'll answer in the right time. Not only is God's timing different from ours, but quite often so are his methods. We may expect the Lord to answer our prayer in some particular manner, have everything all worked out, and then suddenly find that he has a solution to the problem that we hadn't even thought possible. That shouldn't surprise us. He has all of creation at his disposal. He's able to solve problems in ways that we haven't even imagined. Take the Fulanis, for instance. They're called the cattle people of West Africa. Seven million of them, mainly Muslims, who roam all over this part of Africa. Thank you.
It's always been difficult to reach the Fulani because of the way they travel. A lot of prayer has gone up trying to find the best way of following them around. God surprised us with a method we never dreamed of. Umaru Garba is one of our Equa Church leaders, and he's also a Fulani by tribe. He would like to tell you something about the Fulani people. He says that the Fulanis have, for many, many years, been living here in Nigeria, out in the more remote areas. They've been tending their cattle. In fact, the Fulani are a nomadic people. They've always lived outside of the cities. But just very recently, in fact, within the last few years, for the first time, Fulanis have started coming in and living inside the cities. Uh, it's not that these people are flocking to the cities just to hear the gospel, but now they're in a position where they can hear the gospel. For example, in the recent famine, which uh, many people around the world have heard about, Fulanis uh, were driven from one place to another and found that uh, they were close to a church where people who maybe were reluctant before to travel far uh, and give them the gospel suddenly found Fulani right nearby where they could uh, give them the gospel and they would hear the gospel witness. This is the time when we ought to be there and really ready to give them the gospel. Let me give you another example of how God's methods and purposes differ from ours. This one takes us all the way across the continent from Nigeria over to Ethiopia. Dr. Thomas Lambie was the leader of the SIM team that opened up the work there. In 1928, after much prayerful planning, Lambie concluded that God was leading them to start the work at a place called Jimma. Travel would have to be by animal following unknown trails through the mountains. So they prayed for a guide to take them there. They found one who claimed to know every inch of the way from the capital city, Addis Ababa, to Jima, from 200 miles southwest. But they did not arrive at Jima. They wound up here at Sodu, six days travel off course. It almost seemed as if God hadn't understood their prayer. But they knew that they could trust him. And so they settled in. And in due time, they understood why it was that God had brought them to Sodu. <laughs> Unknown to the missionaries, the people around Sodu were ripe for the gospel. The message took hold almost right away. The church became a reality very soon and a movement started in which thousands of people accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. Perhaps the biggest turning to God in a single tribe that Africa has ever seen. And it all began right here at Sodu. Much of it happened during Italy's conquest and occupation of Ethiopia. At that time, our missionaries all had to leave the country. link that we had with these believers was prayer. During this time, the numbers grew from 42 to nearly 10,000 baptized believers. Believe me, we're more than thankful that God has refused to allow himself to be limited to our timetables and our perspectives. These impossible things have happened because God's people prayed. And you know, even more impossible things have yet to happen. That's why the need for intercessory prayer is as great as ever. 
And that's where you come in. I'm often encouraged when I remember that folks at home are praying for us. And I'm humbled, too, when I remember that there are some friends who pray for us every single day. It's an incredible responsibility to translate Christian literature. A lot of prayer goes into this kind of work. And it's a great source of vitality and inspiration to know that while we're busy here, at home are praying for us. When my husband died a few years ago, I definitely felt the power of prayer of other people. In fact, right after I heard about his death, I was not sure whether it was a state of shock or what, but I just couldn't pray. And that's when the prayers of other people were so important and meant so much to me. A few years ago, we, I had an accident, and this airplane is the result of that. Right now, we're repairing it. It was in December 13, 1976, when I was coming back with a full load of passengers, returning to Joss in an afternoon, when suddenly the engine uh, failed. Immediately, I uh, prayed as we were on our way down. I knew that we would not make any airports. There were no suitable places to land. But I asked the Lord for wisdom and good judgment, and also to keep us safe, because I knew we would be crashing in a field or somewhere such as that. To make a long story short, the, we landed in a field and the aircraft received substantial damage. However, no one was injured uh, in the accident. This past year, I was home on furlough. And as I was using this illustration in one of my sermons, afterwards, a lady came up after the service and she said to me, Gary, was that on December 13, 1976? And I said, yes, in fact, it was. Why do you ask? I had not seen the date in the sermon. And she said, well, she said, that morning the Lord woke me up and told me to pray for you especially. And she said, all throughout the day I was praying for you and for your safety. She said, now I know why. She said, I often wondered why the Lord chose to interrupt my schedule to pray for you that day. And I wanted to ask you when you came home. And he, she said, now I know the answer. So I really believe that the prayers of God's people are effective on our behalf. I would like to say that the prayers of the people at home are such an encouragement to us when they write to us or tell us that they are praying for us. We need to recognize that it is a confrontation with the adversary. We need that kind of missionary vision and stamina backed by supporting prayer of a concerned constituency that allows us to face Satan where he is. As one of our missionaries said, grab him by the horns and put him on the run. It's obvious, isn't it, that these missionaries are involved in a spiritual conflict. Everything that the SIM does in Africa is within that context. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. That's why in the battle we're in, we need spiritual power, God's power, power that's available to us only through prayer. Give yourselves wholly to prayer and entreaty. That's God's method, whether we understand it or not. In fact, Christians who don't pray are disobedient to the very plain teaching of Scripture. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, the prophet Samuel told the people of Israel. And that fact hasn't changed a bit. Jesus commanded his disciples, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would thrust forth laborers into his harvest. Christians who don't pray for these kinds of laborers are sinning. Pray on every occasion in the Spirit. To this end, keep watch and persevere, always interceding for all of God's people. How about you? Are you praying like that? Not only for yourself and your family, but for God's work all around the world. Remember, it's a command, not an option, because prayer is a power source for doing God's work, and that power is always there. <laughs>